I'm very excited to have some speakers here today. I'm going to make a couple of announcements about some things and then let the rest of the speakers um, talk today. We've got Mark Cox from Eastman, we've got Corinne Taylor, and we've got Luke Floyd speaking today. And I know that you'll enjoy hearing what they have to say. So I'm excited to talk to you for just a minute about some initiatives and upcoming events related to this year's theme for the spring conference that we hold. Let me tell you a little bit about the spring conference in case you don't know anything Thing about it. Um, every spring we host the Rise Above uh, conference in April and this conference is where we um, highlight and showcase the scholarship being conducted by our undergraduates, graduate students, and faculty as well. Um, research at this conference includes Comp 211 papers, papers that you've done in classes. It could even be um, its independent research projects with your 490 or 499. It could also be research proposals. Um, this conference is a very easy, accessible uh, conference for any student to take part in and present. So I want to encourage you to not only think about attending the conference each spring, but also to maybe consider um, putting in some research and presenting it yourself. You don't have to travel, it's free, so it's very open and accessible for any topics. Um, this year's conference is April 7th, so that's a Thursday. It'll start mid-afternoon and it'll be in and around Durthick. You'll see uh, senior enge engineering projects set up around Durthick, um, and then there will be uh, research papers being presented in lots of different rooms in and around Durthick. Um, the conference abstracts are due March 18th, so I encourage you to think about uh, applying and submitting that so that we can build out the program and select times and locations for when you'll present it that day. Um, among those students that will be presenting will be students like Corinne and Luke um, and other senior um, engineering projects, as I mentioned. The conference gonna, is going to end that day at 7 p.m. with a lecture by Hong Yu Lu, Professor of East Asian Studies and uh, Program Development and Engineering. Um, she'll speak on energy and sustainability within the industry sector. Uh, every year, the Rise Above Conference announces a theme for the coming year, and as you might have already guessed, the theme of this year's conference is creation care. Thus, we've got these kinds of themed projects. Since God's creation includes the whole of mankind and um, all of the entire earth, um, there are many different ways that, um, that we could think about caring for it. So this theme is wide open to interpretation and accessible to students no matter what your topic. Um, the Rise Above Conference presentations, of course, don't have to fit this theme, so I want to encourage you not to think that only topics in this theme can present. Um, but, you know, we will do some small prizes for projects that fit that theme as a way of inspiring and encouraging students. Encouraging students. Um, one obvious topic that fits our theme um, and may hold sessions on um, is things like creation care and sustainability. On campus, we care deeply about the world and people who live far away from us and who are impacted by our collective actions. Um, so, um, sorry, I lost my place. I'm very pleased today to invite you to listen to our speakers as they share some of the research and um, to come to the Rise Above conference on April 7th to learn about some of these projects. Um, I also want to invite you to come to a faculty lecture tonight. Um, there's a lecture at 6 p.m. in Hyder Auditorium. Professors Teresa Carter and Ian Lumhold are going to be co-presenting a lecture on robotics and critical thinking. Uh, incidentally, this lecture fits the theme for next year's conference, which is going to be on ethical innovation. Um, so please join me to that tonight at that lecture if you can. I'm now going to turn it over to um, Luke and Corinne to talk about their projects that fit our theme for this year's conference. Hi there, guys. Uh, my name is Luke. I'm a mechanical engineer, sophomore here at Milligan. And last summer, I took an internship with CMF, which is Christian Missionary Fellowship. Um, and I worked in Turkana, Kenya, on sustainable water projects. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of the work that CMF's doing over there and how Milligan was involved in that. And uh, along the way, highlight some of the things that I think make the project most sustainable and work out. So, so Turkana is a desert. Um, there are no rivers that flow all year round. There's only seasonal rivers. It rains about twice a year there and not very much when it does. So most people get their water by just digging a hole in a dry riverbed. 
there's water underneath the surface, not that far down, but it looks like this. It's really dirty, and they feed their animals from it, and they drink from it, and the sand falls in, and it's just not a healthy, clean source of water. So CMF has been in Turkana for, I want to say, 10 to 12 years, and they decided they wanted to work on this problem. So one of the things that I think has helped this project the most to be sustainable is that they've passed the leadership of this project off entirely to Turkana believers. So there's not a missionary that heads this project anymore, meaning that when the missionary inevitably leaves, the project can continue um, even when they're gone. And they passed this off a couple of years ago to some very, very capable and uh, responsible people who've done a great job with it. Another of the things is every village that they go to, they partner with the community in that village to install this well. So they'll um, talk with the local church or the local leadership to find the best place to install it. And they'll also get some resources from the community. They need sand and gravel for filtration. Um, and they'll also get some help from some of the men to actually do the digging of the well. And that kind of helps um, them take ownership of it. So they feel like they had a part in, in making this, this well and getting water for themselves. And that, um, it helps kind of the, the mentality of it. It's not just a, a dependency relationship. It's more like a cooperation that they feel they've worked together because they really have. And uh, that helps the well keep going as well. And this is the final product. It's clean water from, uh, they, you still have to dig near a riverbed, but that's where the villages are. And um, you can get, they use a hand pump like this. Um, it would be kind of impractical. There's no electricity out in the villages, so they use a hand pump, and that's plenty enough water um, of flow for the whole village. And they can get these hand pumps in Nairobi, so they're not um, importing them from far away. They're not super expensive. It's sustainable, and they can keep that going. So the actual process of digging a well, again, there's no electricity, so you can't use a big rig, or if you did, it would be very expensive. So they just have a hand drill, and you get two people on the other side and crank it and dig the bit down and pull up the dirt and get it out and keep digging and add more links to the, uh, the drill until you get about 30 feet down, and that's where you hit water. And uh, so, again, pretty easy resources to come by. Um, you get all the way down to the ground, and then they can uh, install the pipes and everything to get the water back up. Um, the drills also were just made by the, one of the missionaries, and the Turkana people can just um, keep them up by welding or make more if they need to. So again, another resource that they have available to them, and then they can keep going. And this, again, the final product. Um, it was, I was involved in uh, drilling two wells my time there, one of them we were able to finish while I was there. And it was just really amazing to see the people come together. We, uh, we prayed over the well and blessed it. And immediately after that, everyone came with their jerry cans and began filling up um, clean water for the first time near their own homes. So they, uh, CMF also has a farm project that they have started, similar to the well projects. There's no agriculture in Turkana because, again, it's a desert. There's no water. Um, not a lot grows there. But this is a really good source of income for a lot of people and nutrition, obviously. So they've partnered with a lot of communities. They'll teach them sustainable farming methods and use irrigation from a well that they'll dig near there. Uh, to, and they'll do flood irrigation um, to grow these farms. Uh, at these farms, you need a lot more uh, flow. You need a lot more water constantly, so it wouldn't be practical to have a hand pump. So they install electric pumps powered by solar panels like these. Um, and again, fortunately, you can find these solar panels in Lodwar, the capital of Turkana. Uh, so it's a, another resource that they have available to them. It's not terribly expensive, and they can keep going back to get more and make the desert bloom. And uh, they've, they've got, I want to say, I don't know how many farms, but uh, it's a great resource for the people there. So Milligan's work with CMF, um, they, CMF contacted Milligan to advise them on some problems that they were having with their electric pumps at these farms. They were failing in a couple different places around Turkana, and they weren't sure why. So they contacted Milligan and asked them if they could advise them. So Milligan built a test rig to simulate a well in Turkana, and they uh, built the same configuration of solar panels to try and figure out what the problems were. And they figured out um, the motors weren't getting enough voltage, enough power to them, so the motors were burning out and failing. 
And these were fairly expensive motors, um, so that is kind of a prohibitive thing if you're trying to make this a sustainable long-term project and these expensive motors keep breaking. Um, so the other thing they advised was to use a different pump with a similar flow rate uh, and a different um, power need. And um, so they implemented uh, the solar panel configurations when Milligan advised them on that, but they didn't have the pump yet. So I was able to uh, take one of the test pumps that they had used over to Turkana um, and try and test it and install it while I was there, which was uh, kind of just a coincidence because Milligan wasn't planning on that and I didn't know Milligan was working on this project when I signed up with CMF, but it worked out that way anyways. So I worked with some of the engineers there, tested um, some solar panel configurations for this new pump to try and get uh, a good flow rate out of it that could serve these farms. And uh, I wasn't able to install it, unfortunately, while I was there. I didn't have enough time. But that was a really uh, fun thing to work on to apply the engineering things that I learned here and try and use it to bring sustainable water to people in Turkana. So that's what CMF is doing. Um, they've been working on this for about 10 years now. They've installed about 600 or so wells uh, across all of Turkana. And they're bringing water sustainably, hopefully, for a long time into the future. That's all I have for you guys, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as Joy said, my name's Corinne Taylor. I'm a mechanical engineering student here at Milligan, and I'm working on a senior design project called Plastic Life Cycle. So our team wants to improve recycling at Milligan and just generally reduce plastic waste because plastic is not biodegradable and is so often used for disposal products that are used once and then just thrown out. We want to extend the plastic uh, usefulness and lifetime beyond just that one use. So to do this, we're designing a grinder, which is like a paper shredder, but for plastic. It's gonna allow us to shred plastic into flakes, which are just smaller pieces of plastic. And then by doing that, we're breaking down containers that are taking up a lot of space that are not being used, that are going to landfill and turning them into what is essentially a new raw material that can be used again to create plastic things. So this is going to be a model of our design. There is essentially this big box that's going to be placed on top of a shredder. So you put in the plastic at the top. The sort of yellowish box will be made out of wood so we can, you can put multiple pieces in instead of having to put one in, shred it, put one in, shred it. You can fill it up with some plastic shred it, it'll go down through the funnel at the bottom of that and then into a shredder, which will pull it in, shred it into tiny pieces and then drop it into a container where we can catch it. So we want to shred type five plastic, which is polypropylene. There's seven types of plastic. Of the ones that Johnson City currently collects, they only take limited types of one and two, which are things like water bottles and milk jugs. We want to take type five because obviously there's a need for actually collecting it because right now it's all just going to landfill. So this is things like uh, yogurt containers mostly, as well as red solo cups, and then even like the little tiny tables that come on pizzas. So we want to be able to collect this and sort of fill in that space where plastic is always going to waste and be able to use it. So we're collaborating with the Emanuel Seminary Recycling Club over in the Phillips building. Uh, they're going to help us create this process for collecting the plastic, and then we're going to shred it. Uh, so the basic path will be collection, cleaning, shredding, and then reuse. Right now our goal is to be able to reuse this plastic within Milligan Engineering. Uh, there is injection molding, which it can be used for, as well as other applications. So that way we can not only take it out of going to waste, but directly apply it to Milligan in a way that we can be good stewards of the earth and of our resources and take back what would normally just be polluting our earth into something that we can use for education, for projects like other senior designs as well as freshman projects for anything that would be I, I, anything, I guess, if you will, injection mold or if you form or if you do whatever you want with it, trying to open up the door from waste into new products. So, um, Let's see. So type five is really good for this because of a lot of its properties. It is very heat resistant, so it's used for like if you go to get takeout and you get hot food containers, it's used in a lot of plastic dishware, so there's a lot of opportunity there that we're hoping to take advantage of. 
Thank you. Well, let me express my thanks to Dr. Drennan for uh, talking to us about the Undergraduate Research Conference and especially to Luke and Corinne for not just for sharing, but especially for the work that you're doing. We, we greatly appreciate it. Our next speaker is Mark Cox. Mark is the Senior Vice President and Chief Manufacturing and Engineering Officer at Eastman. Uh, he holds the BS in Chemical Engineering from the University of Tennessee. I thought there might be more enthusiastic applause, but oh well. Uh, he also holds the MBA from Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. There you go. We've got a Kellogg fan out here. Um, he joined Eastman in 1986 as a co-op student. I love that fact. He, is, uh, he holds responsibility for Eastman's global manufacturing, engineering, and construction. He's a senior member of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, a licensed professional engineer, a member of the Tau Beta Pi Engineering Honor Society, and a National Academy of Construction inductee. Well, as you can tell, Mark is a pretty important person at Eastman. But he's also a very important person to us. Um, first of all, he's a Milligan dad. I'll let him tell you a little bit more about that. Yeah, you can, you can be excited about that. I know he is. He's also demonstrated his care for us by serving as a member of our board of trustees. And, uh, and we greatly appreciate his service in that realm. Because of important uh, Eastman COVID protocols, um, as a leader there at Eastman, he wants to observe those strictly. So he will not be available afterwards to, to shake hands and greet everyone, but I can promise you he would love to do that. And, uh, but we appreciate and honor the respect that he has for his fellow employees at Eastman. Please welcome Mark Cox. Well, good morning. It's good to be here. Thank you, Rich, Dr. Drennan. Luke, Corin, what, what a great, uh, really, uh, setup to the talk I'm going to be giving today. Uh, when I think about using your gifts for God's glory to help those in need, as well as uh, using our gifts and uh, the things we're learning here at Milligan to improve uh, the circle with regard to plastics. But I, I just look out on this crowd, and I'm so proud of you all for coming here, for putting forth the effort to improve yourselves and to also commit yourselves to serving the Lord and taking your gifts forward to serve humanity. And this is, a, the, I can't think of a better place to come to prepare to do that. So that's awesome. And I'll say, uh, I've been a staunch admirer of this institution for a long time. My daughter, Sarah, graduated in 2018, my son, Andrew, in 2020. And back in the day when my wife and I were at the University of Tennessee, she had to finish her internship after she graduated. And Milligan graciously in elementary education uh, provided counsel for her and an advisor to do that. And personally, uh, I went to Sullivan North High School. I may have attended a, a madrigal dinner or two here back in the day when I was in high school. For most of you, you don't know what I'm talking about, but maybe some folks do. But it's a pleasure to be here and certainly a pleasure to serve uh, on Milligan's Board of Trustees. Hey, I'd like to give you some insight today into the world in which I live, the world of chemistry. And we'll put the periodic table up there, and I know Dr. Harrell, that doesn't put fear in him, but some of us, I still have a little bit of fear when I see it up there and think about organic chemistry and physical chemistry. But the beautiful thing about that is chemistry plays a vital role in our world. Uh, that's an understatement. Uh, some of the biggest challenges we face today as a world will be solved through chemistry. And in many ways, chemistry is a way of thinking about how the world works and modeling it. You know, our family, friends, and neighbors benefit from what we do in chemical manufacturing, and I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment. And we have workers dedicated to keeping each other safe, protecting the communities in which they live, but also responsibly making products that house, clothe, feed, heal, and transport the world. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Now let's consider for a moment what scripture has to say about the ecosystem in which we live. And in three verses here, Genesis 1.20, and God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. 
And then in John 1, 3, all things that were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. And then finally, Colossians 1, 16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Think about chemistry and the practice thereof. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So chemistry is all around us. And, you know, my eye doctor told me when I was about 40, uh, you're going to need readers. And I was hoping I wouldn't make it there, but I did. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make use of those just a little bit. But it's hard sometimes to appreciate fully how chemistry impacts our world. And we're going to get very specific this morning and think a little bit about what Corinne was talking about and a little bit about what Luke was talking about as well in terms of water. But it's easy to overlook since we're kind of removed from chemistry. In, in other words, I'm standing up here. I didn't really think about the chemistry that went into making this microphone housing, but a lot of chemistry went into it. Thinking about drinking water, thinking about what Luke said, thinking about plentiful food supply, abundant energy, life-saving medicines. Every day, chemistry is involved in that. In fact, more than 96%, almost all of them, of manufacturing goods are directly touched by the chemistry in the chemical business. 96% of what's made on earth is directly touched by the chemical industry, which is why the U.S. government considers the chemical sector a critical part of our company's infrastructure. Now consider for a moment how it affects your everyday life, and this collage really gets a hold of it. I really enjoyed college. I hope you are too. The sheets you slept in last night, unfortunately mine didn't get washed. Well, they did once a semester. Not quite enough. Uh, I know, that's kind of gross. The sheets you slept in last night, the floor you stood on when you got out of bed this morning, the water from your faucet that you brushed your teeth, hopefully, if you didn't, please start, uh, uh, from your faucet or shower, the toothbrush handle that you used, and Eastman makes material for those handles, the toothpaste that you put on that toothbrush, the shampoo that you used for your hair, the clothes that you wear today, the food you ate for breakfast, the smartphone that you can't seem to live without, your computer, the energy that lights your way, the furniture you sit on, the desk you use to do your homework, the paint on your walls, and the car you drive, and so much more, and I think 100% of those uh, are close to it. Eastman has a product that goes into those. So chemistry affects your lives. Chemistry makes a lot of things possible. Think about getting through COVID without chemistry, without the durable housings in hospital rooms, without the fabrics to make the mask. Wouldn't be pretty. It wasn't pretty, but it would have been much worse. You know, for the past 36 years, I've had the privilege of working at Eastman and being part of bringing these solutions to the world. And we say our moral purpose at Eastman is to make the world a better place by enhancing the quality of life of human beings on earth in a material way, a little play on words, by making the materials uh, that help make life better. Now think about it. I remember when I was where you were and this number was much smaller, but our, soon our planet will have 10 billion human beings, 10 billion souls transiting their journey on this earth. And there's a mounting tension and you may have noticed it. Normally I do a lot of Q&A and interaction, but think about it. What's the tension between? We're to be good stewards of the earth. There's tension between the growing demands on resources of the earth required to house, feed, clothe, transport the world, and the, and the world's ability to do that. And we've got to do it responsibly. And I'm just going to give you a few numbers, but each year 300 million tons of plastic are produced globally. Only 16% of it is collected for recycling. Corin was talking about collection for recycling. Many municipalities just stopped doing it because there's no outlet for it. Back in the day when I was your age, that was a big thing, collecting for recycling. Of that 16%, 
or of, of the 300 million tons, 16% is collected, only 12% is recycled. The remaining is waste. 25% gets incinerated, 40% goes to landfills, and 19% ends up unmanaged. That's a problem. Sustainability is no longer an add-on to doing business, certainly not at Eastman. It's a business imperative, and that's why we've made it a central part of our strategy. And I want to talk to you a bit about that. Now, are plastics a bad thing? Think about that. We've got a plastic waste problem. We'd have a problem if we didn't have but plastics. Now, as a Christian, I see the purpose of addressing this issue holistically, this waste crisis, as highly aligned with what God says about stewarding the earth in Genesis 2.15. Think about it. Even before the fall of man, we were called to steward the earth. We were called to work. Work is a good thing, and I, I know you're working hard right now in the university, but you're preparing to work hard in your profession as well. You know, we're deeply committed to the performance of our products at Eastman, and how we make them is just imp as important. So we need to manage them throughout their life cycle and make them in responsible ways. And we launched our circular economy effort, and I want to break that down in a very practical way uh, in just a moment. But it's about avoiding waste and keeping materials in circulation at the end of their useful life. Rather than sending them to the landfill, rather than one and done, how do we capture the value, for example, that plastics bring to humanity, but not dump it in the landfill when we're done with it? Surely we can do better than that. I'm going to show a little video that we've produced, uh, it won't go the whole way, and I'll give you a little add-on at the end, but this captures a bit of what we're doing. It is definitely not a regional problem. It is a global problem. There's got to be a better way. There's got to be a different approach. After you've created that much material, where does it go? And our oceans, our environment, landfills, incinerated up to the air, those aren't acceptable options. We are a manufacturer, we make materials, therefore it is incumbent upon us to be part of the solution. The world is expecting us to deliver. We've got to come up with a better answer. And it's going to take companies like Eastman that are willing to step out and make early investment and to show the world what's possible. And it's going to take people like Bruce Bruin. He's really the perfect combination of scientist, and just a practical everyman. He was the plant manager for the original uh, polyester recycling plant that was in Rochester, New York, and is one of the key inventors on the redesign that we are getting ready to install here in Kingsport. The process was first developed at Eastman Kodak Company in the 70s. The original process was a methanolysis process, and it was to, to uh, break down plastic back into its raw materials to do molecular recycling so that we would have raw material to run the plant. What started out as x-ray, films uh, expanded into a lot of different types of plastic as the engineers made it more robust. Over the years in that process we chose to switch out equipment to use different processes to come up with different ways to get to higher purity uh, with lower energy costs and lower energy costs is better LCA. We spent 40 years learning to do it. Didn't start out easy. Took upwards of a decade to get pretty good at it honestly. That heritage has given us this opportunity today to build upon this quickly, to show the world what's possible, to give them the opportunity to choose what's right for the planet and choose it right now. We want to believe that that material that we're dropping in a recycle bin somewhere is absolutely getting converted into a new material somewhere and that it doesn't somehow find its way to a landfill or incinerated or even worse to a waterway. You know, the numbers are staggering. In a mechanical recycling process, essentially the materials are, are collected, they're separated by type, and there are different businesses that will purchase those and they will reclaim them. It's a fairly simple process, but to do that requires pretty high quality materials. Even the most recycled plastics, even with PET, not everything can get back into a circular economy. Most PET can't get from a bottle back to a bottle. Most of that is going to be downcycled into films and fibers and things that can't get back to that bottle. So it takes technology to do that. Rather than, you know, that take-make-waste linear 
economy that we've had before. The circular economy is served by being able to bring a technology to market that allows us to unlock those, those value that's still in the material. A big part of what we're trying to do is today you think about plastic waste as waste. With a new ecosystem, with new processes, waste can be seen as something different. Waste can be seen as raw material with value. Once something has value, people are going to treat it different. In molecular recycling, we take a material and we break it back down to its building blocks. We take the waste streams, we take, we take the streams that nobody else wants. We're targeting the hard to recycle waste. How can we make that new again? We're using a process with methanol and catalysts to break plastic down into just one step below plastic. You know, from polymer to monomer. The farther you have to go back down into a, a basic feedstock, the more energy is to go this way and the more energy is to come back up. By going back just that one step, we can get a, a process that has, you know, a million to one, a billion to one uh, refinement of impurities and components in that system. One key advantage that molecular recycling brings to the table is the ability to repeat the process over and over. So you can essentially create a nearly infinite loop. This can happen again and again and again. This is not about one time and it's done. This is about as many times as you can bring it back, you can use it again. I think this technology proves that that is a future we can count on. It's not just an aspiration. It's not a pipe dream that's that's so far in the future. This isn't something that's, you know, five years out, 10 years out. This is something we've known how to do before. We're doing it. Uh, that that covers it pretty well what we're aiming to do, but I, I do want to mention that near the end of that video, if it had uh, continued, you would have heard the word responsibility. And a good question to ask all of us at this point in human history is what is our responsibility to steward God's earth? We've been given a lot. Certainly in this country we have. Luke gave us an example of the resources we have in this country relative to some others. But using our technology at Eastman, we can recycle products an infinite number of times. That's hard to think about. But that's the beauty of this technology that's being built right now in Kingsport, Tennessee with the support of the state of Tennessee, which we very much appreciate. We want to show the world what's possible. I think this is definitely the first of many to be built. And it's important to note that Eastman is not in the single-use plastic business. We used to be at one time. Can anyone just think off the top of your head, single-use plastic, what comes to mind? Go ahead. You can verbalize, I think. Water bottle. Water bottle. That nailed it. And we used to be in this business, and we kind of pioneered it, but there you go. Single-use plastic. Some people call it a water bag now. It's so thin-walled. It doesn't have to keep CO in, right? It's not a carbonated beverage. Uh, so uh, it's not a hot fill either. It doesn't keep a juice in it. So you can keep it really thin, and they've gotten thinner over the years, but that's typically a single-use plastic. And the shame about that is, well, the good thing about it is it delivers hydration to people who need it in many parts of the world. That's a very good thing. Plastics aren't bad. They have really helped us. But how do we responsibly prevent this from being once through? So Eastman, about 15 years ago, we introduced a, a, a material, and you may be aware of it. Does anybody know the brand name of this before I show the brand name? Pardon? Well, now Gene is the, the company, the consumer brand company. Absolutely. Good. And does anybody know the the Eastman Plastic uh, brand name? It's Triton, and it's our Triton product. And this is actually Triton Renew. So the, the beauty of Triton when it came along about 15 years ago was it was so durable. I mean, you could literally run over this with a truck, and it will still be usable, and we've done that. So that is not a single use, right? And it's bisphenol A free also. It's plasticizer free. But this says Triton Renew, which means it's already being made from repurposed plastic. We already have a process to do that. But the beauty of methodolysis, as the video indicated, is we're going to take hard-to-recycle materials, plastics, break them down to their 
basic building blocks, the raw materials for plastics, and make another one. That's different from chopping it up and then remelding it, where you lose properties. It's not as useful. There's a place for that, and we support it. But we need to manage all the waste, and our process in particular deals with the hard to recycle material. Well, I'm gonna close with just a couple of thoughts. One year ago, well, first of all, anytime plastic winds up in a landfill, that's a waste. That had utility, but it's a shame for those raw materials to end up in a landfill and stay there. That's not, not responsible in the long term. So we announced a year ago that we are gonna invest $250 million with the support of the state of Tennessee to build this plant in Kingsport, and it's underway. A few weeks ago, I don't know if any of you heard about that, my boss, our CEO, was in France with French President Macron, and we announced that we are going to partner with the French government to invest up to a billion dollars in a material-to-material -material molecular recycling facility in France that will allow world-scale conversion of 260,000 met, 260, metric tons of polyester into durable products every year. Well, we're proud to be part of this, and at scale, our operations will recycle more than 500 million pounds of waste plastic by 2030. We know it's not enough. That's just getting started and we're continuing to support improvements in recycling systems, continuing to expand our capabilities, and uh, making more complex products, uh, taking more complex feedstocks to do this. But Eastman can't solve this alone. Uh, we're connecting with customers, with non-government organizations, with policymakers, with government elected officials, and even with the waste industry to work toward a more sustainable future. Together we are starting to win. We're starting to create ways to manage plastic waste well, to manage the world's natural resources well, and to improve the quality of life for mankind. We've set an aspirational vision for our future, and our commitments are part of a bigger picture, a better circle, if you will. So the circle rather than the linear approach. And it speaks to the interconnectedness of people. Luke met some people he didn't know on his mission trip. He'll know them the rest of his life and the rest of their life. As we act on God's call to us to serve mankind, this is what it looks like. It's gonna take at least another decade of effort where experts, problem solvers, improvers, innovators come together uh, to create a future where everyone has access to a sustainable life on this planet that we all share, that our fellow man shares with us. Well, I'll close with this. Think about it. As you go forward, and most of you are probably between the ages of 18 and 24, uh, as you go forward from this beautiful campus with the wonderful education you've received here, you've learned a little bit about your giftedness. How will you leverage the gifts, the wonderful gifts God's given you to serve humankind. You might think, well, that's as a missionary. Well, that may be, yes, and, and please do consider that. But you can also do that as an engineer at Eastman or any other company on this planet. You can do it as an accountant, you can do it as a waiter, a waitress, you can do it as a missionary, a pastor, or a business leader. It's endless. And I know you will commit to doing that. And I want to give you a little reminder to help you think about how am I going to use my gifts going forward. So you never can get enough Triton water bottles. And I saw one or two out in the audience, but that's not nearly enough. So each of you will be able to pick up as you exit the auditorium today a Triton water bottle put it to good use, and it's so durable, literally, that when you're uh, at the position I am right now, 30-some uh, years down the road from where you're sitting, you can still have that water bottle, and I want you to ask yourself this question when you look at that uh, on your shelf or in your basement. How did I leverage my gifts 
for the glory of God and for the benefit of humankind. Thank you all for having me. Take care. If you volunteered to uh, help pass out water bottles, we've got some people who are coming to this station and some who are going to the back. Go ahead there now. If you volunteered to pass those out, there's about seven or eight of you. Go ahead and make your way there. The rest of you, if you would sit still for just a moment, we're going to finish with a prayer. There we go. Our volunteers are moving. The rest of you, if you would remain. Thanks. I'm, thanks to all of those who spoke today. An important message. We all have responsibility to care for God's creation, to care for one another, and to care for the material resources that he's given us. So I hope the water bottles will remind you to use your gifts well and to honor God in that way. Please pray with me as we close. God, thanks. You have blessed us immensely. It's our privilege to live on this beautiful earth. With that privilege comes responsibility. And uh, my prayer is that we will uh, seek to live up to the responsibility that you've given us to care for your creation. We thank you for all the work that's been shared today, and we thank you for the work, for the ways in which you'll use us in the future. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>